So if anybody else joins while we're chatting, I'll just let them in. Um, so my name's Susan Simmons, um, and I'm an engagement officer for Hampshire and Isle of Wight Wildlife Trust. Um, so I usually spend a lot of my time outside leading groups from all ages, from children up to adult courses on wildlife identification um, and various things like that. But obviously over the last year, we've learned to do a lot of that online. Um, and actually it's been much more successful than I had imagined it could be. So, um, so today we're going to be talking all about the sort of wildlife that you might find in your school grounds. Now, like I say, if you've got any questions at all throughout, feel free just to interrupt or put them into the chat. Um, we've got an hour and a half, but I have allowed time at the end for questions and discussion because I think it would be quite dull to listen to me for a whole hour and a half chattering on. Some of you may have been on the previous, I know that Wendy you were on the previous course, some of you may have been on that previous course which was all about um, improving your school grounds for wildlife. So today it's a sort of follow-up really um, to find out a little bit about the sorts of wildlife that you might have there and how to identify some of those things. So before we start, has anybody got any questions at all or anything you're particularly interested in? No, no questions from me at the moment. Okay, right. In that case, then I think we, we can get started. Okay, so the three sort of things that we want to look at this afternoon, we want to be able to identify, to discover some of the different species that might be living in your school grounds. We want to build confidence in identifying them using identification keys and to get some tips on how to work with your class to identify some of these different species and how to integrate that into the curriculum teaching. So I'm going to sort of focus on a few main areas that you may have in the school grounds to sort of look at how we can identify some of these species to start with. So school grounds, they can offer a, a great variety of habitats actually for a whole range of wildlife. So, and they vary, this, I, I understand that school grounds vary considerably. Um, some of you may have insect hotels, for example. Some of you may have just a, a log pile somewhere. Um, there may be areas of, of longer grass or sort of slightly more wild areas. You may put bird feeders up possibly to attract some of the birds. You may be lucky enough to have a pond, a school pond. Um, it may be perhaps a little bit neglected, but it may still be there in, in need of a bit of restoration. Or you might be thinking about putting in a small pond. Or it might just be that you've got a hedgerow perhaps around the edge of the school grounds or maybe you've got some idea of putting some planters um, outside of the doors. So, you know, it can be a whole range of different things that can attract wildlife. So what we want to do is have a look at how we identify some of that wildlife that comes to some of those areas. So I thought I might start off having a look at pond wildlife, because I know that there are quite a lot of schools that have ponds or are thinking about putting little ponds in. So obviously the obvious things that we might start to see right now would be the frogs and the toads. Frog spawn is just appearing everywhere at the moment um, in ponds. And then there are things like the damselflies and dragonflies and possibly some newts and things like that. Now, if you don't have a pond and you're not able to put a pond in perhaps, then this is something that you might consider. So this is really a mini wildlife pond and this could be anything from just a tiny washing up bowl, if you like, sunken into the ground somewhere in the school grounds. And believe it or not, that in itself can attract quite a lot of wildlife. So this is an activity sheet um, that you can find on the Wildlife Watch website. There are lots of activity sheets like this of things that you can do with the children to attract wildlife into your garden. So, so as I say, if you don't have a pond, then this is, this is an alternative really, something that you can do. 
I'm going to use pond and stream wildlife because it's just quite a nice way of illustrating how we can identify some of these smaller creatures and how we can integrate that into the curriculum learning. So I want to share with you the Field Studies Council guides, which you may or may not have come across. Um, have, have any of you come across these guides before? Yes, we got a few of them. Yeah. Yes, they're brilliant when you laminate them and you can take them out into the pond. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, they're absolutely brilliant. They're really great for adults and, and for children, actually. And I really highly recommend them. I've got quite a collection myself. And you're right, if they're laminated, then they're brilliant outside. They don't, they don't get damaged very easily. So this one is the freshwater name trail. And this is brilliant for pond wildlife and also for stream and river wildlife. And it's really quite simple to use because you follow the key. You can see here, you just follow the arrows and you'll be asking a question and getting a yes or no answer and continuing along until you find hopefully the creature that you've got in front of you. And I just wanted to show you some examples of things that you could identify using this. So if I look at this next slide, so these photographs, um, I've mentioned this in a previous course, people might be interested in, these were simply taken with my phone, my iPhone, with a little clip-on lens. I'm sure people think I've got shares in these, but I really haven't. A little clip-on macro lens, which just costs a few pounds. I'm just admitting somebody else. One second into the waiting room. I just scribble down lady's name. Great. So yeah, so these were just taken with a little clip-on lens um, onto my phone. So you can you get some really good detail, actually. But the idea is that if you've got your, your children and you've got a little pond um, or perhaps you're out on a field trip and you're able to do a little bit of stream dipping, then you'd have your white trays and you'd have your nets with your pond. Obviously, you'd be doing your sort of figure of eight movement with the net and then you'll be putting into the tray what you've caught and having a look to see what you found. And this is often a point where people think, oh, my goodness, I don't know what anything is. How am I going to identify this? Now, that's where I would suggest that that freshwater name trail is absolutely brilliant because most of the things that you will find will actually be on there. So if we look at the very first picture, if I go back, uh, in fact, we'll look at the first two to start with. This picture in the middle may just look like a, a bunch of gravel, but it's actually a cased caddis fly larva. Um, and these are tiny creatures that will stick the gravel together and they'll make a tube and they'll live inside that tube. So it's perfect camouflage on a stony bottom and it's really, really good protection from predators. And they have hooks on the end of their body so they can carry this around and stay inside this tube. So that's the case caddis. They're quite hard to spot because they're very well camouflaged, but once you get your eye in and you see them moving about and you see the little head of the creature coming out, you start to see them. And as I say, we've got this snail shell here. So if we just go back to that previous slide. So if we go to start here, we go to the very beginning of this. Our first question is, does it live in a case or a shell? Well, for both of those first two creatures, then our answer is yes. And then you'll see the next one. So you go to yes and you go along the arrow to the next question. Is the case made of leaves, twigs, sand or stones? Well, for that second picture, that cased caddis fly larva, the answer is yes. And we've instantly found our creature on here. So that was a very quick one for the children to identify. Now for the snail, again, the answer was yes, it does live in a case or a shell. And then the next question, is that case made of leaves, twigs, sand or stones? Well, no, it isn't because it's a shell. So you follow up no and you find mollusks. And then if you look at those pictures you've got there, we can see from that that we've got a ram's horn snail. So again, 
that's quite an easy one for the children to identify. Now that third creature was slightly more tricky. So they may perhaps need a bit of help with that one. So if we go back and look at that, now you can see that third creature there on the right hand side. Now have a little look here. You can see it's got three tails at the end of its body and we can see it's got six legs. So now if we go back to our chart and we start at the beginning, does it live in a case or a shell one? No, doesn't. So we follow that along. Does it have legs? Yes, it does. So then we're going to follow on to the next sheet. We follow that yes arrow onto the next sheet. Does it have jointed legs? Now, if we were to go back, I will just show you, just so we can have a look. Okay, so if we look at this creature, you can see, if we look at those legs, you can see that they are jointed. You see they've got joints there. So now it's needing to go back, isn't it? So the question, does it have jointed legs? Yes, it does. So then we follow the arrow to the next question. Does it have more than six jointed legs? Well, no, it doesn't have more because it has six. So we follow the no arrow. And then we get to the question, does it have one or more tails? Well, yes, it did, didn't it? It had three tails. So if we follow the yes arrow, does it have more than one tail? Yes, it does. We keep going up. Does it have two tails? No, it had three. So we follow no. Are the tails longer than the width of the body? Well, yes, they were. So then we go up to this final question here at the very top. Are the tails thin and hairy? body often with gills along each side. So those tails are thin. Now it's quite hard to see the gills in the photo, but there were gills along the side of the body. So that takes us to the mayfly nymphs. And that's what we have there. Now that one is slightly more tricky to identify, but what you could obviously do is just look at the pictures on here and look at them all and think, oh, Actually, it does look a bit like one of those mayflies. So then you could almost work backwards to see if, it, if you can get it to that point. Because I think, you know, you've got the questions and you've got the pictures. So it makes it a really user friendly guide for a range of abilities. So that's just a demonstration, really, of how we, we could use this freshwater name trail to identify most of the things that you would find. So. If we go on to this next slide, um, I really love this, this sort of creation on the left hand side here. This was done for a river fly survey, so a little bit more in depth. But what we've got here, we've basically got this great tray that's separated into compartments so that the children could potentially do some sorting and classifying these creatures. Now, underneath, somebody has made this lovely chart and they've obviously got pictures of the different animals. But, you know, we could make it much more simple. We could perhaps separate these into groups of creatures with six legs, for example, creatures with three tails, maybe um, creatures that are living in a case or a shell. And you can see if you put water in these trays, then the children could separate their creatures out into these compartments and it's a really useful way of helping them to classify what they have. So you can see the links here, we've got some really nice curriculum links to science, we've got working scientifically, we've got living things and their habitats, evolution and inheritance, classification using keys, we can look at food chains, life cycles and adaptations when we're looking at all of these creatures. And again, these, these two pictures on the right were taken just with that little lens clipped on. Now it's quite hard to take a picture of them when they're swimming around. So what I tend to do is use, we've got some very old plastic spoons, which we've kept just for the purposes of stream and pond dipping. And if they're clear, then you can put the creature in a little bit of water in the spoon and then take a photo while it can't move very, very far away. So that's a freshwater hog louse in that middle picture, which is very similar to a wood louse, but lives in the pond. And then we've got a stonefly 
over on the right hand side there. So when I got the children looking into the trays, you know, what I try to do is ask them some questions to get them thinking about classifying them, to get them thinking about their life cycles and their adaptations. So with all of these pictures here, for example, if we've got a group of creatures, then I might say to them with these, you know, what do they all have in common? Can you see anything that they may have in common? And obviously they could see perhaps the number of legs, the number of tails. They might see also the gills, which you can see on the side of their body. And if you were looking at these in the water, those gills would be moving about a little bit. They might notice though that there is an odd one out here, this one here that has wings. Well, that's because it's the adult stage. So again, it's a great opportunity to talk about life cycles because all of these others are mayfly nymphs. They are different species maybe of mayfly, but they're all mayfly nymphs. They all live in the water. They're all adapted to living in the water. They have gills to help them to breathe under the water. So they need nice, clean, well oxygenated water. And then they will hatch out and they'll live in the water for a couple of years as a nymph. But um, interestingly, they'll hatch out as the adult and they will live just for a day, which is amazing as an adult and they'll just be mating and laying eggs. So it's a really nice opportunity to talk to the children about life cycles when we're looking at some of these creatures. Has anybody got any questions so far at all? Feel free to shout if you do. No, maybe not. Okay, so again, looking at life cycles, it might be that if you have an area of water, you might see some of the adults of these species. So we've got some dragonflies here that you can see and some damselflies. We've got the adults on the left hand side. And then on the right hand side, you can see that we've got the nymphs. So, oh, we've moved on to the, the next one by mistake. You can see we've got the nymphs. So you can see we've got this lovely well, in the middle at the top, we've got this lovely banded demoiselle. So you can see it's got that banding on the wings. And then right next to it on the right, that would be the nymph. So that's the young um, nymph that lives in the water. And again, six legs and three tails. But the difference between that and the mayfly nymph, these tails are more sort of leaf-like rather than point, rather than a thin sort of point. So this would be our banded demoiselle and nymph and then we've obviously got this lovely golden ringed dragonfly on the left there which is the adult and right across on the right hand side you can see we've got a nymph a dragonfly nymph now in a pond we're probably going to find some of these dragonfly nymphs and these are quite fun to find they're quite um aggressive predators let's say They've got a really interesting way of feeding. They've got a, a jaw which they can unhinge and it's sort of, it's called a mask. And when they want to catch their prey, they can shoot that jaw out in front of them to catch their prey. So they've got some interesting strategies which we could certainly talk about with the children. And you do often find those nymphs in the pond. They will even eat tadpoles actually. So they do catch some quite big prey. And then when they want to hatch out, they'll come up out of the water and they'll rest on a plant stem and shed their skin and turn into these beautiful adults. And these adults, these dragonfly and damselfly adults, they'll live for the summer, for most of the summer. And they'll obviously be flying around catching their prey midair. So they're quite nice. You can talk, you know, we can talk about food chains, we can talk about life cycles, adaptations, and different habitats. The children might be interested to know that the certain species will live in the pond and others will live in a stream in flowing water. So we can talk about different habitats and different adaptations to those different habitats. So some other interesting creatures that we might find 
in the pond as well. So, um, so in, in the picture here, you know, often I'd say to children, when I look at this picture, how many creatures can they see in those two pictures? Has anybody got any, any thoughts on that? Two in the first picture and yeah. three on the second. Yeah, well, that second one, I wonder if it is um, one or two, possibly two. And I wonder if it's two leeches on the back of that beetle, actually, on that second picture. Um, so potentially three in that picture. And you're right, two in the first picture, because that on its back there is another one of those little mayfly nymphs having a bit of a ride. Um, anybody know what? what the creatures are, the other creatures. The second one of the boatman. Sorry, I, I missed that. Is the second one a water boatman? That that one is a good guess actually, is a diving beetle. Diving beetle. <laughs> yeah, that, that one is, but it's very very good guess. It, it, that one's a diving beetle. This one on the left, I mistakenly, I needed a better picture. I've cut off um, a great long spike that comes from its back end. So I don't know if anyone's come across one of these before. Is it a so, water scorpion? Yes, it is. Yeah, absolutely. So this is a water scorpion. The children always love to find water scorpions. And the interesting thing about those is that they've got this snorkel. And that is what that is, that spike coming off the back end. Everybody always thinks it's a stinger. It's going to sting them, but it's not. It's a snorkel and it allows them to breathe. It allows them to poke that up above the surface of the water and to breathe air. So that's how that particular creature manages under the water. Mayfly nymphs have got their gills, but the beetles are quite interesting because the beetles, what they quite often do, including water boatmen, they will take an air bubble down with them. So the children often look at the beetles swimming around and it looks like they've got silver tummies, but that silver is an air bubble that they're taking down with them to breathe with. So they've got some really interesting strategies for coping underwater. Um, so you can talk about those adaptations, you know, like I've said, we've got the gills, a whole range of creatures have gills, then we've got snorkels, and then we call them the scuba divers. So the beetles and the water boatmen and even the water spider that will take down these air bubbles so that they can breathe underwater. So then there's just a couple more on the water theme. So these caddis fly larvae that we've mentioned, um, this one on the right here, you can just see he's poking his head out of his case. So I might say to the children, you know, some of the sorts of questions I'd be thinking along the lines of, of asking them would be, can they think of any materials, three materials that caddis fly larvae can use to make their cases? And so the children would need to think perhaps about what's in their environment, what's in their habitat, what might they use, what would be useful, what would be perhaps good camouflage, good protection. So they will actually use stones, they'll use sticks and they'll use leaves, they're depending on the species. And they will also put these stick it all together in a slightly different way depending on the species. Some make this beautiful, really neat mosaic um, like this one in the second picture and then others stick everything together slightly more in a random, more of a random fashion. And then I asked the children, oh I keep doing that, sorry, I asked the children um, on one occasion how they thought that they stuck these things together? What did they think they used to stick them together? Does any, anybody have any idea? Anybody want to hazard a guess? No? So they actually use a kind of silk produced from their salivary glands to stick all of these stones together. So quite interesting. And then this last one here um, is, is also quite interesting because it's red. Um, does anybody know what this is? No. Nope. Nope. So it's a midge larvae, basically. Um, and if you use that FSC guide, 
um, to help to identify it, what you actually end up having to do, this is a non-biting midge larvae, you actually have to count the segments, believe it or not. So you'd get to a point where it says fly larvae have less than 15 segments um, and are usually like worms or maggots. Um, so we would know if we count the segments that it's going to be a fly larvae. And it's, it is red, so I might ask them why it's red. And that's actually because it is B, that's because it contains haemoglobin. So it helps it to absorb oxygen. So you'll often find these creatures where there's not so much oxygen. They're quite able to cope. They can adapt in low oxygen environments. But again, all of these creatures can be found on this FSC guide, which I think is pretty good, pretty user friendly. So that's a bit of a, a look at some of the freshwater species that you might find if you're looking in a pond or if you go on a field visit perhaps to a stream or if you want to create a small pond. Um, oh yes, and the last one I've got here, just to show you, um, these are actually newt tadpoles. And again, nice um, to be able to talk about life cycles, to be able to talk about, when <laughs> I've gone and gone to the next one again, to be able to talk about adaptations, because obviously these lovely feathery structures are gills behind their head there. So, so again, if we have a pond and you have newts, it's nice to be able to talk about these sorts of creatures and how they change um, and how they leave the pond when they become adults and then come back to breed. So those are the newts. So in terms of resources for having a look at identifying all these different things, we've got those FSC guides that I've just mentioned, and there are a whole range of those. So I've just put a picture here of a reptile and amphibian FSC guide, and they are very, very good at helping to identify for example, on this front page, you can see those newt species and they would help you to identify which newt you might have. Um, something else that's worth having a look at is, are these wildlife watch spotter guides. So if you go onto the wildlife watch website, you can find these really lovely spotter guides for lots of different subjects. So this is obviously a spring wildflower spotter guide, which will help you and help children you know to to walk around and have a look and see what they can find it's worth um, noting that you can create your own spotter guide on that website as well so that's a really nice thing to be able to do based on what you've got growing in your school grounds so if we if we move on to have a look at plants we're going to have a little look now at how we might try and identify some of the plants that we might find in the school grounds. Now, I know that, you know, very few people are fortunate enough to have a really big meadow, for example, in the school grounds. So we're just talking about some of the common plants that you might find perhaps on the edge of the playing field, perhaps underneath, growing underneath a hedge, or if you've got a sort of slightly rougher wild area, you might see what's growing there. So these are the, again, these are the, if you're very much into it, then if you really would like to get into wildflower identification, then I would tend to suggest using this Francis Rose book on the left, the wildflower key, which is really, really good. And then we've got these other FSC guides. We've got this guide to grass and plants one. Um, the, the number two is particularly for chalk and limestone, but this one in the middle, number one, is very general. And this will have the most common plants that you are likely to find growing in an area of grassland. So you can see on the front there, we've got, for example, the common nettle. We've got several different types of thistle. We've got some nice orchids as well, which are always lovely to find. And a couple of plantains, which are very, very common. And I'm sure you could find those somewhere um, in, in the school grounds, certainly the plantains and the thistles. So, so again, FSC guides, really, really useful for a sort of basic overview of what you might find. Now, I 
run um, wildflower ID courses, usually in the summer. I did them online last year, which I probably will be doing again this year. Um, and the way that I tend to teach people wildflower ID, because it's quite a big subject, is to focus on family groups. So if you have a look at this, you can see that this is the top 20 British wildflower families. And you can see that 70% of all of our native British species fall within those top 20 families. Grasses are really difficult, so that's a whole different subject. But what I tend to suggest to people is maybe to familiarise themselves with two or three quite common families and the characteristics of those families. And then when you see a plant, you might think, ah, oh, that looks like a member of the pea family or that looks like a member of the cabbage family, for example. And that gives you a really big head start when you want to identify what it is. So what I thought I would do today is just show you a couple of the common families which you might find in the school grounds and some of the characteristics of those plants. And once you know those characteristics, as I say, it will then help you to spot other members of that same family. So you don't need to start from scratch, but you, if you had that book that I talked about, that Francis Rose book, then you could go straight to that family in that book, and that would give you a really big head start to find the species you've got. So I'm going to just tell you about a couple of families of plants. So the pea family is actually a very, very common family. And you should probably find a lot of plants belonging to the pea family um, growing, you know, in the local playing field, even if we think about things like clover um, and certainly in the average lawn. So this family is a nitrogen fixing family. So they can actually fix nitrogen from the atmosphere and put it into the soil. So hence, they're quite often planted in order to do that. Um, in a farmer's field, perhaps, when it's when it's a fallow field. So compound leaves, what that means is that they're broken up into leaflets. Those leaves are broken into little leaflets. Now, interesting, every flower in the pea family is arranged in the exact same way. So they all have their petals, each part of this flower that you can see on the right, every part of it, has their petals arranged in this way that I'm trying to show in this middle photo here. You'll see that the petals consist of this big one, which we call the standard petal. Um, they consist of a keel. So there are a couple of petals underneath that sort of form like a keel of a boat. And then there are wings on the side. They're insect pollinated. So the insect lands on it, it opens up and they're able to pollinate it. They tend to produce seed pods, very sort of characteristic pea pod type seeds, all of these plants do. But the key thing really is the way that flower is arranged. So if, for example, you looked at a clover flower head, you would see that every single part of that flower head, if you teased it apart, it's made up of lots and lots of these tiny flowers, which all have their petals arranged in this particular way. And this is the same for all of the pea family, you know, for gorse and broom and the birds for trefoil that you can see here and the vetches and all of those pea family plants. So again, here we go. There's some more pictures here of more pea family plants. So if you wanted to look in more detail, you would find that they've generally got 10 stamens which have which bear the pollen. Um, I mentioned the sort of pod, the elongated pod that houses the seed um, and the leaves. Trifoliate quite often just means in three parts and pinnate, broken up, um, divided, sometimes spiny like gorse that you can see here and broom. Um, and the leafy stipules, that just means tiny leaf-like structures sort of at the base where the leaf joins the stem. So you've got the common birds for trefoil, we've got gorse, we've got the red clover and the white clover. So you can see that red clover, that flower head there, if you looked at every tiny part 
of that flower head, you'll see, you'd see that, that they're made up of those petals that I explained to you, the keel, the wings, and that standard petal. And it's obviously larger and easier to see in some of those others like the gorse. So it's quite a common family. And once you get the idea that those flowers are all arranged in that way, you'll start to see them. So there'll be the vetches, the bush vetch, the common vetch, the meadow vetchling that grow in the hedgerows. Um, we've got the sandfoin down the bottom there, which is actually introduced. That's not a native species. Um, but you can see the flowers with that same arrangement, slightly larger, so easier to see in that particular plant. So to get to know the characteristics helps you to spot one and think, oh, I know what that family of plants is, and then it will be much easier to work out which species. And the other family of plants I just wanted to mention, because again, really, really common, and you're likely to find these just growing everywhere, really. And this is the dead nettle family. So these all have shared characteristics. So they have square stems, believe it or not. If you find a white dead nettle and you feel the stem, you'll feel that it's rough and hairy, but it's also square, it's not round. So that's one of their characteristics. They have opposite leaves. So you can see on the yellow archangel on the right, they've got pairs of leaves that are arranged opposite each other up the stem. And the flowers tend to be really close in the stem. You know, they're not on stalks hanging out. They are close into the stem. And when we talk about the corolla on my list, that really just means all of the petals together. And they, if you look at them, they're, they've got five parts, so five lobes, and then they're fused into a tube. And you can see that on that little black and white drawing there that the petals are all joined and they go down into a tube. So again, you've got this, the calyx, and that's really the sepals which are underneath the petals and you can see that it's just sort of sitting in there. Um, and that again is five, it's got five points to it. Now the other really characteristic thing about this family of plants is that they are generally aromatic. So they generally all have a scent. Not necessarily a nice scent, mind you, but they have a scent. So, for example, wild marjoram and wild thyme, which we might grow in, a, in pots even, um, because they're fantastic herbs that we can use, but they're also really good for pollinators. So they would attract butterflies and bees. So they smell really lovely. White dead nettle, it does have a scent. It's quite strong, I think, quite distinctive not necessarily nice but it is quite strong and things like um, hedge wound work they have quite a strong smell so that again is another characteristic of them so we don't need to worry too much you know about the ovary and so on but the point is these characteristics help us to identify them you might see these plants with square stem leaves that are opposite each other quite strong smell sort of similar shaped petal arrangement in these five parts or five lobes and that will tell you perhaps that you're looking at the dead nettle family and again if you've got an idea of the family you're looking at that's really going to help with the identification of the species and now in terms of the children it might be that what we could do is have a look at what we've got in the school grounds and create our own spotter sheet on that wildlife watch website so that then they've got this checklist of the sorts of things that are growing out there and they could go and see if they can identify them. And they could have a look, a closer look at some of the parts of the plants um, and some of the leaf shapes and that sort of thing. So we've got a nice um, spotter sheet here for autumn leaves. I think autumn leaves are always really lovely to look at and there are spotter sheets for looking at autumn fruits for nuts, looking at nuts and berries. If you have a hedgerow, for example, or maybe you've got some shrubs, then it would be really nice to have a look at the different leaf shape and to have a look at some of the seeds, some of the berries that they are producing. And again, we've got some really nice links here, um, some nice science links. Um, I knew I was gonna do that. What it is, 
I'm trying to move um, the sort of thumb thumbnail thing, you know, the little icons of all of you so that I can see the text that I've got on the right hand side, but I keep clicking and missing. That's why it keeps moving forward. So I just wanted to say those links again, we've got plants, obviously, we've got, you know, working scientifically, we can look at evolution, inheritance, living things and their habitats. And again, classification using keys, life cycles, we can talk about, we can talk about pollination with plants and obviously seed dispersal, adaptation. So, you know, there's a whole lot of things that we can gain from looking at some of these plants. And I think the trees and shrubs can be really useful for that because obviously we can look at the, you know, looking at the different nuts and the berries and thinking about how they're dispersed, um, thinking about whether they're eaten, thinking about whether they might be sticking onto the fur of animals and being transported that way, or whether they might be wind blown, for example, some of the really fine seeds. So there's lots and lots of different ways in which we can explore some of these different topics looking at what we've got in our school grounds. So has anybody got any questions at all? Because I'm aware that I'm chattering on as usual. <laughs> Anyone got any questions? No thank you. No? Okay. I was just going to ask about um when you when you purchase plants for the pond yeah um where, is it a good can you get like native pond center is there a better place to source them you can sorry you cut out slightly but i think you said can you get native pond plants did you oh I think I've not. I think I lost you. I hope it's not my internet. Sorry, I think my connection's not very good. That's all right. So you were asking about getting native pond plants. So um, I would definitely suggest getting native plants. You're right because some of the non-natives can take over a pond. It's not a not a good idea. There are certain plants that you know it's best to avoid. So native plants would be really good to get. Um, what I can do. I've got a little wildlife gardening club that I run quite regularly. And I know that recently one of the ladies on there has just sourced some native pond plants. So what I will do, I always say to people that I generally send this PowerPoint out to you afterwards on WeTransfer. And when I do that, I will send you, I'll just make a little note now. Um, the place that she said she bought her native pond plants from and I think they were all online so I'm just going to and I can share those links with you for, for buying those plants so pond plants so I'll just make a note because I can't remember it off the top of my head I brought mine from a company called Puddle Plants and they were really good oh right great I told Puddle. them exactly what we had and left it to them and they sent us um, a selection of plants that was suitable for what we wanted. Great. That's good to hear. Brilliant. Puddle plants. OK. And I'll see if I've got some other um, recommended links as well or places that people have used, you know, that I can share with you afterwards. Um, so yes, yeah, so thank this, you. That's great. That's okay. You're welcome. Sorry, did anyone else have anything to ask at that point? No. Okay. Um, so yeah, the spotter guide's brilliant, and as I say, you can make your own as well. So that's really useful. Um, so. I want to talk a little bit about butterflies and plants because I think butterflies are wonderful. And obviously we've also got the terrestrial insects and mini beasts. And again, there are really good um, FSC guides. There's a woodland name trail, which is more about looking under logs and under leaf litter and the sorts of creatures that you'll find there like millipedes, centipedes, wood lice and those sorts of things. So that's the woodland name trail. And there is also, um, I think it's called Bugs on Bushes. That's the other FSC 
guide, which has got some of the more common mini beasts that you'll find in the bushes um, and on the grass, perhaps. So that's another really nice one to use. And the butterfly one, which I've got here, actually, I think that um, butterflies are always a really nice thing to try and learn because there aren't huge numbers. So um, somebody was, I listened to a really great webinar by Plant Life earlier today, actually. Um, so I'd recommend actually that some of their, their webinars are fantastic. And um, Trevor Dines was the chap who did it. And he was, he was giving some numbers today and he was saying, we've got 59 different butterfly species, but there are two and a half thousand moth species that pollinate our plants. So I think butterflies are quite a nice one to learn because there aren't too many actually. And that's similar to trees and shrubs, our native trees and shrubs. Again, we only have 60 or so. So again, it's not huge quantities to try and learn. So I think butterflies, you've got a good chance of trying to learn them because there aren't that many. And obviously not all of those are going to come into the school grounds or into our gardens. So we can have a good go at learning the ones which we will see regularly. And we, it's great if we can provide some nectar plants for the adults, but also some food plants for the larvae. And then the children might be able to have the opportunity to see the whole life cycle from the egg through to the caterpillar and the chrysalis. That would be wonderful. And the actual adult butterfly itself. So butterflies are quite nice. So the sort of early ones that we're likely to see are the orange tip, which I'll just come on to in a moment. Um, that's one of the first ones that emerges and flies. The brimstone, the yellow butterfly, has actually hibernated as an adult over winter. And that one is also one of the earliest that we tend to see. I think that that's one of the earliest that come out of hibernation. And the orange tip is one of the earliest that I believe actually hatches as an adult in the spring. And we see that one flying just after um, the brimstone. So if we have a little look at a couple of the more common species, it's just worth, I think, saying that some of our really common plants are really valuable for us to observe and learn from. So nettles, people are always, you know, afraid of nettles and afraid perhaps of children being stung by nettles. But actually so many creatures like nettles that what I say to children is, we don't need to touch, we don't need to use sweet nets to go through them because we don't want to get ourselves stung. But what we can do is just go and sit quietly next to them and just observe, just have a look, just see what you can see. And quite often you'll find them covered in ladybirds, for example, but they are the food plant of some of our butterflies. So the comma, for example, and on the right here is a peacock caterpillar, the peacock butterfly caterpillar. Now they feed on nettles. So nettles do really have a place for some of these creatures. Um, they can also be used, I believe, as fertilizer. If you cut them down, put them into some water, they make quite good fertilizer. They also have other uses. You can make nettle tea and nettle soup, um, and you can make nettle strings. So actually, if you're into sort of forest school type stuff, they can be quite useful to have if you've got them under control somewhere. And it's good learning for the children to know that they can sting, but they are useful for wildlife. So have a look and see if you've got some nettles and you might be surprised, you know, to see quite a few different creatures on them. Now the orange tip butterfly, again, this plant here that it needs to complete its life cycle, well, actually it uses this one, garlic mustard, and it also uses cuckoo flower or lady smock is another name for that. And that plant grows where it's quite wet. But this plant, garlic mustard, grows everywhere. We've got it in the garden, under the hedge. I see it by the roadside, just like nettles really. It pops up everywhere. It's a member of the cabbage family. It's edible, it's slightly garlicky, but it is the food plant for the caterpillar for the orange tip. So have a look in the school grounds around the edges and you might find this plant. And if you're lucky, you might see orange tips on it laying eggs. So this happened in my garden, in my back garden. 
um, I was on the lookout, you know, last lockdown in last year, we all had more time at home. A lot of us did, I guess. I was working at home. So in my lunch break, I'd spend a lot more time than usual just observing things in my own back garden. And by just sitting and looking and going up and looking at some of these plants and just gently lifting the leaf and looking underneath it, I found an awful lot that I'd not ever really noticed in my back garden before. So this garlic mustard appeared and lo and behold, the orange tip butterflies laid eggs. This orange egg here, you can see in the left hand picture, was just taken again with that little clip on lens onto the camera and that hatched out. And then we've got the little caterpillar and the caterpillars feed and feed and grow and grow. And in the evenings, what they do is rest on the seed pods of the plant. So these flowers on the top of the plant turn to seed pods and the caterpillars are super camouflaged and they will rest on these seed pods in the evening. Um, and then obviously, eventually, they will become pupa chrysalis and then they'll turn into this adult butterfly, which we should see flying in April, I would say. So it's quite an early one. But really, this is, again, just to illustrate how interesting, you know, common plants can be and how important they can be for attracting wildlife into the garden or into the school grounds. Dandelions are another amazing plant. So, so common. They produce masses of nectar. This, this um, interesting webinar I listened to earlier was comparing the, the amount of pollen and nectar that a lot of different plants produce and dandelion produce huge absolutely huge amount of nectar so really really important for a range of pollinators and again in my garden I saw quite a lot of different solitary bees and honeybees brimstone and orange tip butterflies all feeding on dandelions so if it's possible just to leave some dandelions to flower they're great for pollinators um, and obviously when they go to seed, they're quite interesting to talk about that life cycle and that wind blown seed and how that disperses and so on. So common plants are definitely worth getting to know. Um, so on, on this picture on the left is an apple tree. So if, you know, there are any shrubs around, um, I do know a few school grounds that have got one or two old fruit trees in them. The blossom can be really, really great for pollinators. So um, we had holly blue and common blue coming into the garden. And then that's the brimstone I mentioned, that really early um, flying butterfly in the middle there. Um, the dandelion on the right, and then we've got ivy. So this ivy here with bees on it, Ivy is, I always, always go on about how brilliant I think ivy is because again, it's really common, but it is so important for wildlife. It really is. So ivy flowers right at the end of the summer into the autumn. So it's one of the last flowering plants in the autumn. And you'll find if you've got a sunny autumn day, it will be alive. It will be buzzing with bees, with any kind of insect that's trying to feed up and feed up before they hibernate for the winter. So it's really, really important as a last nectar source um, for a whole range of different species. Then those flowers will turn to berries, which will feed birds and other creatures over the winter. And of course, because it's evergreen, then it provides a really great hibernation site. Um, also for things like those brimstone butterflies, they'll hibernate in, in amongst the leaves in ivy. It's obviously a good nest site for birds and really good for bats as well. So if you've got old trees with lots of ivy, they can be bat roosts. So it's, it's really good. So again, it's important not to overlook those common species. If you've got them in a hedge or somewhere on the edge of the grounds, it's a really good idea. Just have a look and see what you can see when the sun's out. So log piles, leaf litter, insect hotels, all of those things provide us with opportunities to see a whole range of mini beasts. So again, we've got Wildlife Watch mini beast detective here, and we've got some FSC guides. And obviously there are books if you want to get into more detail, um, but it's just great to get the children looking and 
you know, like we said, talking about life cycles, talking about the characteristics, having a good close look at all of these creatures um, and working out how they move, working out, you know, as much as they can, classifying them, looking at numbers of legs and all those sorts of things. So log piles are great to have because you can just have a little look underneath and you might be surprised what you can find. Sometimes amphibians as well, you might find underneath those. Um, yeah, so again, these were just all in the garden. So this is an oil beetle on the left, um, which is quite interesting. They've got a really interesting association with solitary bees. Um, oil beetles, they will lay their eggs near to solitary bee nests in the ground and the larvae of these oil beetle will climb up onto a flower and when the solitary bee comes to feed on the flower the larvae will grab hold of the bee and hitch a ride and get taken down into the solitary bee's nest where it's a parasite and it will feed on the grubs and the food stores of the solitary bee. So we've got both of those in the garden. So they've got this really close association, really interesting stuff that goes on when you just start to observe and, and see what's going on. And then obviously we've got ladybird and this is on ivy again, and then hoverfly. So, so yeah, it's just, I think, nice just to stop and stare really, and just to have a close look at just what's all around. I mean, all of this was just in a back garden with a normal, lawn not massive garden at all just a normal lawn um you know and i've just started to look and it's amazing what you can actually see there actually and then birds of course um some schools i know feed birds some don't because obviously it's expensive for a start you know to to feed um top up seed and fat balls and things all the time um but again there's a nice garden bird detective um, sheet here that can be used to help identify some of the common birds and there are surveys that that go on the one that's obviously just past the garden bird watch would be that kind of thing is quite nice for children to take part in um, for their observation skills have a look and see what they can see so so birds um, and then sort of getting towards the end here just wanted to list perhaps some of the ways in which we can start looking at the school grounds and sort of monitoring what's there really. You can start off by perhaps doing surveys um, to see all, all the different species that you might have there and then you could sort of do that each year to monitor and see whether we can perhaps increase the number of species by planting certain plants that are pollinator friendly for example. And over time, you know, see how that changes. And there are many different ways for us to do this, to, to monitor the wildlife with the children. The first one I put, we've got here, that's Longworth traps. Now that's perhaps not the easiest thing to do with children, but these are small mammal traps, whereby obviously you're not hurting them, but you're trapping them late in the evening and then looking first thing in the morning to see which small mammals might be in your school grounds and then releasing them. So that's quite interesting, but not the not everyday thing, I suppose, that schools would be doing. Then there's nest boxes with cameras, which can be really fascinating because you can obviously watch the whole process of the birds building the nest, laying the eggs um, and fledging. And that's really quite exciting. Sweet nets if, are great if you've got a longer grass area. When it's dry, you can use a sweet net like these two in the picture here. Um, to see what's in the in there and then you can use the tiny little um, bug pots with magnifying lids and then the children can have a closer look and perhaps use those FSC sheets that we've talked about or some of the wildlife watch sheets and things like that to have a go identifying the creatures that they find. Torch is on the list because um, not so useful with, for the children but if you're looking into a pond to see the amphibians and reptiles that you might have, the best time is in the evening when they become more active. So you'd need a torch to shine in so that you could have a look and see what you've got in there. A moth trap would be really great. I have done this with one school group before 
um, there was actually a, a camp night organised at this particular primary school many years ago. And during the evening, we ran a moth trap. And um, first thing in the morning, that was opened up and we were able to identify the moths that we'd found and release them. And that was really good fun. Reptile felt, if it's appropriate, obviously, you know, that's a piece of felt um, that you put down somewhere where you think there may be reptiles and you can have a, a peek underneath there to see whether anything might be under there. Um, if you're in a bit of a wet area, you might have grass snakes, for example. You might have slow worms anywhere, really. Um, they all would be quite nice for the children to find. Pond dipping is great with some pond nets and some white trays. Um, taking photographs and, and just sitting and watching and um, really just enjoying. And I, I always say, we talked last time about worrying about actually um, disturbing or trampling the area that you are trying to observe. And I think something I said last time was, um, if, you know, it might be that you need to rotate around and you might need to leave areas undisturbed for a while so that they're not getting overused. But sometimes, you know, I've done many times in the past with children, rather than going through that long grass area, like those boys in the picture with the nets, instead of that, you can just walk along the edge and just stop and just look and just lift up the leaves and just watch and you'd be amazed at how many things you can see and we tend to use a paintbrush and each child has a little pot with a magnifying lens and very gently they can use that paintbrush to put anything they find into that little pot and then use their sheets to have a go at identifying what they found and that way they're not walking in amongst it, they're just on the edge and they're leaving that habitat to rest. So if you feel that it's being overused, then that's a really nice thing to do instead. So it sort of minimizes the, the um, disturbance really. And obviously it depends a bit on the weather. If it's very, very wet, then you wouldn't want to go, go in with a sweep net because it might be quite damaging and actually also for the creatures if it was quite wet. Um, so has anybody got any, any questions before we just finish with the last few slides, the last few South Down slides? Anyone got any questions? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Well, we're nearly, nearly done. So we can always just have a quick chat at the end if anything comes up at all. Um, so the last few slides are just really to say, oh no, there's this one I had forgotten. I've just realized, yeah, I had actually forgotten. So I have, I realized I focus very much on science, the science curriculum and all the things that you can achieve with the science curriculum. But it's really important to say that actually there are so many links with other areas of the curriculum here, things that you can achieve outside. You know, we can, we can cover literacy, speaking, reading and writing, numeracy, art and design. And an example of that I have put here just on the right. Um, and you'll see storytelling as an example. Um, so for example, creating your own story. So the children can be outside, they can be finding objects in the space that we're using and looking at them closely, exploring them, feeling them, looking, smelling. And then what they can do is think of all those things that the different items could be. So for example, a leaf could be a fairy boat, an acorn could be a pixie hat. And they can come up with a story using those items that they found to tell a friend or perhaps create a story together as a group. So one person tells part of the story, then the next person tells the next part of the story with the next item that they found. So this is just one example where you can be looking at those items. So for example, in that picture there, those seeds, which you can also talk about, you know, seed dispersal and plants and, and all of those sorts of things, life cycles, but then you can use it for literacy as well. And maybe you can even, even use it for numeracy. And this is one course which we did run a few weeks ago, which will also be on our YouTube channel and on the South Downs National Park website. So if anyone is interested in literacy and numeracy in particular, um, you should be able to access both of those courses as well. 
So it's really just to just to make sure, you know, we're aware that we don't have to go outside just to teach the science, but we can bring in literacy, numeracy and so on into the outside teaching as well. I think it's really important to remember that. So that was that one. And then, yes, so finally, really, this, this is just to say that this training we've done today has been developed through the South Downs Education Network. Um, there's, there are over 100 centres and sites in the South Downs delivering activities to schools and helping them to understand the qualities of, of this protected landscape. Um, so the network offers all of these things on this list here. So curriculum linked sessions and activities that cover all of these topics you can see here. Um, obviously, at the moment, though, residential trips aren't possible, but we have online learning instead. Um, so it's just worth pointing out all of those things that can be covered. Um, and obviously, by taking part today, um, you're helping to build this learning outside the classroom. Um, and obviously, you know, there are so many benefits to that, really, that we're obviously all very aware of as we're all here. Um, and here are some resources, extra um, links, and I will make sure I send all of this to you so that you have all of this. And one thing I did just want to mention that people might be interested in is that there is actually a travel grant available for schools that have more than 10% of their pupils eligible for free school meals. There is a travel grant which can give you up to £300 um, for travel to one of these South Downs um, centres that we've talked about. So it's, it's just worth mentioning that really. So I think that is my last slide. Yes, it is. So I will stop sharing. Um, so as I say, I'm really happy to send this to everybody. I generally say that I will send it via WeTransfer unless you perhaps put in the chat that you don't want to. Um, are we able to access the slides from the literacy course? Um, so I know that it's online, but I don't, so therefore you'd be able to sort of pause it and see the slides. Um, do you mean you'd like the slides sent to you or would you be happy looking at it on online? I suppose that's the question because I could actually arrange to send them to you if you would like the literacy ones. I can make a note to do that. So yeah, if you could just let me know that it is online. So it will be on the YouTube channel, the Wildlife Trust YouTube channel and uh, sent if possible. Okay, yeah, that's fine. I'm gonna write that down. Um, literacy slides, no problem. And I will send the slides from today via WeTransfer and also that pond plant source that I know I've got somewhere as well. So I'll do that. Um, that's no problem. In your experience, what's the best group size and does it change for different ages? So I guess you mean um, the best group size to take a group of children outside for a sort of outdoor learning experience. I guess that's what you mean, yes. So I find personally what I tend to do if we have a school group, so an average class, maybe of 30 children, then I would split them in half. Um, and I would work with one of our experienced volunteers or another member of staff. And we would generally have those two groups. Now, that's because I suppose the site we work at um, is a bit limited for big groups because it's quite it's got a lot of narrow paths. And the area where we do a little bit of stream dipping is quite small. Um, but we would definitely split that group in half at least. So we'd have 15. And then we would get them perhaps working in pairs or in small groups to do the activity. So I think that would be a good size, depending on your area, I guess, depending on the size that you're going to be working in. So hopefully that helps. Has anybody got any other questions at all? No, thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, and yeah, as I said, 
the previous course, if you missed that one on how to encourage wildlife into the school grounds, that's also on that on that YouTube um, site. So you should be able to access any of those things. And I always say to people, if anybody thinks of any questions afterwards, anything you wanted to ask at all, feel free to email me. I'm very, very happy to to answer anything. I will get back to you, definitely. So um, thank you very much, everybody. But uh, yeah, we're a bit early, but I guess if no one has any questions, then that's that's it. Is, is that OK? Or any any last questions? No, that's good. Thank you very much for everything. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.